Hello, everyone to, um, from around the globe. Welcome to another edition of the ICC webinar. My name is Junior Tu, and I will be the moderator for today's event. We're extremely fortunate to have two esteemed guests to join us today, Professor Jarari and Professor Choi. Professor Jarari will give us a talk on technological advances in cranial maxillofacial surgery and introduce ASMS, while Professor Choi will tell us about the ASMA and Korean Cleft Palate Craniofacial Association Symposium that will be taking place in Seoul from April 21st to April 23rd. In addition, we have invited Professor Yao, Professor Lin, as well as Professor Halak to be our panelists tonight. Now, before we begin, let me give a proper in introduction of Professor Jarari. Professor Jarari received his bachelor's degree at Stanford University, then obtained his doctorate degree at Stony Brook School of Medicine. He trained at UCLA School of Medicine for his plastic surgery residency and also for his clinical fellowship. Now, Professor Jarari is the Assistant Chief of Plastic Surgery at Olive View UCLA Medical Center. He is also currently the co-director of both the UCLA Cranial Facial Clinic and also the UCLA Face Transplant Program. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Jarari. Professor Jarari? Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Tu. It's such an honor to be here this morning. I'm sure all over the globe people are chiming in at, at uh, different times, but, you know, I, I've always been, you know, the Changgung Memorial uh, Program has always been a, a mystery or mystique to me. I've had so many good close friends and colleagues who have gone through there and trained there, and it's really an honor to be invited to participate in your program. And it's also great to see some of my American colleagues here and some of um, our former international craniofacial surgery fellows um, like Dr. Rego and Dr. Alam, who, who, uh, who I met for many years uh, ago at UCLA. And so I'm really impressed by the global reach of your program. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, we're going to do a couple of things this morning, one very brief, and then uh, the rest of the time we'll spend on this talk on technology. Um, the first thing, should I share my screen now? Yes, please do. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is, uh, together with Dr. Choi, just want to give a um, very brief sort of introduction to the society uh, in the U.S. and the society in Korea. Um, I'm currently the president-elect of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, and we are now in our 76th year. Last year, we celebrated our 75th anniversary, and we're one of the longest-running organized plastic surgery societies in the U.S., and I invite you all to spend a minute or two on our website um, just to see what we're about, and some of you know the society. Some of you may even be international members of the society. The focus of the society is education. From the outset, the, so the focus of the ASMS has been education and teaching, and having uh, recently done a bunch of research into the origins of the society, it truly um, is a group of surgeons that was born out of the desire to sort of codify and uh, structuralize education in maxillofacial training. And as the years have evolved, we've partnered with the American Society for Craniofacial Surgeons to sort of uh, be the, the number one resource for, for craniofacial and maxillofacial teaching um, in the US. One of uh, our, one of the hallmarks of our group now is the publication of the FACE Journal. This is a journal that didn't exist a couple of years ago. And uh, John Van Alst is the editor in chief. And uh, at our board meeting a few years ago, we decided that it would be very, very beneficial to start a journal specifically focused on this by our group on this subject. So in partnership with the American side of craniofacial surgeons, we uh, initiated the publication of this journal. And, and I invite you all to take a look at the FACE website and, and uh, submit your, your papers to the, to the journal for publication. Uh, last year for our 75th anniversary, we wrote uh, a series of historical articles just to detail uh, sort of the origins of the of the group, um, and I authored a paper with my mentor, Dr. Kalmoto, uh, talking about the very early days of this of this society, you know, dating back to 
the post-World War II era, and we broke it up into every 25 years, 25-year uh, blocks until uh, the, the current present day. And uh, really on our website, you'll see that this is the, uh, this is the essence of the uh, ASMS, and that is these series of courses, an advanced course that we teach with the uh, Society for Craniofacial Surgery and the basic maxillofacial techniques course, which is a very hands-on course uh, teaching res primarily residents and fellows about orthognathic surgery, facial trauma, and other sort of basic uh, topics and basic techniques to use. And um, as it just so happens, my good friend, uh, Dr. J.W. Choi, uh, he and I were having dinner in Paris at the International Society of Craniofacial Surgeons, uh, got to be six or eight years ago now. And we were talking about you know, working together, ASMS and the Korean society. And so because he is unstoppable, Dr. Choi, and once he gets an idea in his head, you know, that, that idea is going to come to fruition. Um, we have, uh, we are partnering uh, this year on the inaugural uh, first ever uh, joint symposium between the ASMS and the Korean society. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and let uh, JW tell you about that. Okay. So from now on, I will briefly um, make a brief the promotion of our joint symposium. Um, actually, um, as most of you already know, so the, uh, the this year, the uh, biennial APCA and then Asian Pacific, the Eclipse Liban Palate and Craniofacial Congress will be held with the conjunction with the uh, Changgung Forum. So, um, it is uh, really the huge event for the craniofacial surgeons, but actually for the beginners, actually um, sometimes it is too big. So actually, um, the our the uh, annual the craniofacial symposium will be held with the uh, conjunction with the ASMS for the first time for three days in April twenty first and twenty third. So actually, it will be held in our the um, Seoul Asan Medical Center. So how to start this joint symposium? Actually, um, this is the, uh, the picture I took <laughs> in 2003. I visited the UCLA at the time the Reza Jare was our there. Actually, although at the time we didn't know well, but we met again in 2018 or 19. So actually we discussed many things and actually um, we found out many common the feeling about the cranial surgery field. So, the, uh, in general, the number of participants in craniofacial surgery society looked much smaller than compared to that of the reconstructive microsurgery society. And how to recruit more younger surgeons to this field and how to maximize the cooperation among the Asian craniofacial surgeons and the how to cooperate with the American and, and European craniofacial societies. So uh, we decided to... Uh, <clears throat> hold the uh, conjunction, the joint symposium to, uh, at the first event, then the, this will be held the, uh, the April 21st and 3rd, including the live surgery. On the first day, it, the live surgery will, will include the, um, especially the aesthetic the jaw surgery, the, uh, as well as the aesthetic facial bone contouring surgery like the malaplasty and mandibuloplasty. And room two will include the cleft lip and palate repair and room three will mostly deal with the facial trauma, including the endoscopic repair on the blood fracture or retromandibular condyle management in facial fractures. So some of the ASMS faculties will participate as well as uh, some Korean and Japanese and Taiwanese, the plastic surgeon, including the Peng Yun Chu. So the, uh, it will be um, the, uh, added with the uh, some the simulation society in a uh, Saturday and Sunday. So I hope many of you will be able to participate in this the symposium. So suggest so my suggestion is uh, let's we need to find out the way to collaborate with the American or European the societies and then uh, can we make these joint symposium or workshop a platform for encouraging the young Asian surgeon to be interested in craniofacial surgery? And actually, we I think 
we need a, a little more practical workshop or joint symposium for not only the experts, but also the beginners. So the, uh, this is, I hoped this um, the joint symposium, as well as the Changgung Forum, we, the, will be a platform for encouraging the young, the Asian surgeons to getting more interested in the craniofacial surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Choi. And now um, we'll head back to our presentation and our talk for today, Professor Jarari. And Professor Jarari will give us a talk on technological advances in cranial maxillofacial surgery, fact, fiction, and new frontiers. Professor Jarari. Thank you. And uh, thank you, JW. You know, I can't agree with what you said more. The, the, our focus in the ASMS uh, and its origins of education with the basic course is to focus on resident education and fellow education, but we do try to uh, attract um, practitioners of all levels who are interested in maxillofacial and craniofacial surgery. And yeah, we're, we sort of are competing with our microsurgery uh, colleagues for, for the attention of those young surgeons and to get them excited. The only thing I didn't like about your presentation is you know, you showed a picture of us in 2003 and 2019. You look like you are younger 16 years later. And I feel like I look like I'm 50 <laughs> years older than that. No, so no. other than that, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, Peng Yang asked um, me to give this talk. And I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. And speaking of, you know, audiences, uh, it seems like it's a wide range of, of people who are, who are, tuning in. So some uh, younger surgeons who may not have a, a lot of exposure to some of you, you're very experienced in using these things. And my interest in, in working and, and sort of collaborating with international colleagues is I find that depending upon where in the world you are and what sort of resources you have available to you in your institutions, your, uh, the resources that we have may be varied. So, so some of these things may be things that you are way ahead of the curve. And some of them are things that you don't use in your practice because uh, your hospital costs is, are too high. Even in the US, some of these things uh, uh, are unavailable even some of our major medical centers because hospital economics and financial boards do not allow us to use them. So um, in terms of what I hope to do today is uh, uh, to review some of the, the technology that we are actually using in our craniofacial surgery techniques today. And those are things that I'm sure many of us are using uh, across the globe and in, in on this call, the CAD CAM technology, VSP, intraoperative navigation, 3D printing, custom implants, all the things that are just a few years ago, we're just starting to enter the market, if you will, and then now in very common practice. And, and, and those are sort of the facts. That's, that's, that's what the, the current status of our, of our world is. And then there are sort of emerging technologies or newer technologies that are, have been well adapted in other fields like robotic surgery, for example, in cardiothoracic surgery, but also things like augmented reality and virtual reality. These are technologies that are here and that have been applied in craniofacial surgery. But, you know, is it fact or is it fiction? Are these technologies that are in search of a home? Um, and uh, is our field suited to adapt these technologies to our work? And then just a little brief discussion on some emerging technology that people are now trying to apply to craniofacial surgery um, uh, and to see if those are, are actually worth uh, are worth our time. And those include, I guess, artificial intelligence is the one that's getting the most attention these days, but also biomedical modeling. And, and I'm not going to talk about gene therapy or tissue engineering or stem cell therapies, because that's going to take too long, but, mm -hmm. um, but we'll just mention it briefly. So it's pretty incredible to think that, you know, just not even a hundred years ago, this is what the operating room uh, looked like. And uh, maybe there are some of us who Nah, probably all of us just looking at the photos of everyone who's logged in. We're a little too young to remember these days, but you know, in the World War One, World War Two era, you know, this is what surgery looked like. And just you know, less than a century later, this is what the operating room looks like. And and these are 
the operating room actually begins on our on our laptops and our desktops in, in pre-surgical planning. And we have incredibly well outfitted and appointed operating theaters that really incorporate biotechnology and bread and butter surgical practice. So we've come a long way in a short amount of time and the momentum for progress just uh, seems to, to keep on growing. But I think we have to be sort of, you know, wary, I guess, or regimented in how we approach uh, the application of technology to surgery. And I sort of ask myself a series of questions whenever I hear about a new uh, piece of tech that someone's using in the operating room, or I hear a talk like this on a Sunday morning, or I go to a, a national international meeting and someone presents something, or I read a paper, and I'm, I'm always thinking, you know, is this technology applicable to what I do in the operating room and what we all do? Um, is, the, is the application of this technology practical? Is it sort of easy to do? And, and is it necessary? In other words, there's an expression that we have uh, saying, uh, describing technology in search of a home, meaning someone will describe uh, an advanced piece of technology, software or hardware, and then they have it and they need to justify its existence. So they will uh, endorse or push or support the application of that, that, that technology to a surgical technique or discipline where it may not be a natural fit. Um, and so these are sort of my criteria when, uh, when I decide on whether I should be adapting a new uh, surgical technology to, to what I do. Um, number one, it, does it have an impact? Does it make a difference? You know, if I if if applying it doesn't change anything, then then maybe it truly is technology in search of a home. Does it make the surgical technique easier, better? Does it facilitate what I'm doing in the operating room? And does it have a positive outcome or a positive impact on the surgical outcome? Um, because I'm in an academic center, I'm also focused on education. So is it easy for me to use? And can I teach my residents and fellows? And can I teach my colleagues how to use it? Because if it's so complex that it's very difficult to understand how to use, then for me, it's almost useless. Um, it shouldn't obviously put an additional burden on the patient, both in terms of a physiological burden, but also financially. And that's very unique, I think, to uh, depending upon the financial picture in your, in your medical centers and in your practices. Um, and most importantly, the bottom line question is, would I incorporate this into my practice? And so I don't know if I have these characters right. I hope it says uh, yes or no, or, or the equivalent of yes or no. And if it doesn't, I apologize. And uh, um, I'll take uh, blame for that. Um, it's perfectly correct. <laughs> <laughs> great, thank you. Um, so, I'll, so I'm going to ask these questions. And, you know, when I give, I'd like my talks to be... Um, Plenty of us give very boring talks, and myself included. All my talks are very boring, so I try and be a little entertaining and funny. But also, I try and in, involve when I'm when I'm giving a talk in person. It's a little harder on Zoom. I like to involve the audience and ask questions and maybe have a show of hands. It's going to be hard to do that here. Um, maybe you guys can see if you have a grid. But I'll ask these questions at least rhetorically as we go on. So, you know, so it's like you know, virtual surgical planning, yes or no, and, and we'll get to that. Um, so, um, so in terms of the facts, so there are certain things that we've actually enjoyed over the past 30, 40, 50 years, really in the 1970s, there was sort of a revolution in terms of, uh, medical technology, uh, that, that a lot of the younger surgeons don't, don't appreciate. And, and I'm not that old. Some of these things happened when I was just, you know, a, a young boy, um, but but they at the time there were significant advances in medical technology, um, maybe more simple than what we might think of today, um, and that we've all incorporated into our practice. And these are the facts of our daily lives in the operating room. Um, so, for example, in the 1970s, computer tomography was introduced, and then from there we had more digital. The sophistication, we have multiplanar reconstruction, three-dimensional rendering, and now more recently, cone beam uh, tomography, cone beam CTs that allow a much, much lower radiation with a very detailed imaging of the craniofacial skeleton. So yes or no, of course, these are things we all practice. So that's a clear yes. Um, 
advances in visualization, you know, also in the 70s is when the, the world of microsurgery began and, and microscopic uh, microscopes were brought uh, into the operating room and follow that endoscopy. Are these technological, te we don't even consider these technological advances because we weren't around when they were transitioning, most of us maybe, um, when they were transitioning into the operating room. These are standard for us. So do we use these? Yes or no? Of course, yes. Um, and then, and some of, uh, I actually just wrote a, a chapter for a, a, a textbook on craniofacial surgery that's coming out talking about some of the advances also since the 1970s, primarily beginning with mini plate fixation and then following with ultra uh, resorbable hardware and then other things that we now use on a daily basis. Like uh, I like the Sonopet system. Some people like the Paiuse electric system for ultrasonic bone cutting cranial orthotics for, for, to complement endoscopic craniosynostosis uh, cranial repairs and so many things that, that are just sort of part of our daily conversation. And we just get so easily in the OR, at least, you know, in a well-resourced healthcare system. So, so these are all facts of what we do. Um, and then in the last, I would say the last 10 to 15 years, uh, there's been more technology that's that primarily software based, I think, um, that that has contributed to improved outcomes and facilitated virtual surgical planning and certainly doesn't increase the burden on the patient. There may be some financial considerations here. And I think these are things that most of us who have access to them, are using in our practices. And if we don't have access to them and, and we, we could have access to them because of finances, then we would agree that these are useful things. So, so the application of some of these uh, technologies to orthognathic surgery, um, yes or no, I think we would all agree that um, that these are gonna be a yes. And so, so I'll, as I'll digress into just orthognathic surgery for a minute and you know, the goal of orthognathic surgery is to obtain a proper uh, relationship between the upper and lower jaws with this in mind, the, the facial thirds, you know, the ideal uh, golden rules of beauty. And these norms, um, I, it's interesting that these norms seem to cross cultural and ethnic uh, backgrounds. This is a very, uh, from what I understand, a very well-known uh, Taiwanese actress. Um, and uh, and the, the the notion of proportions are important, uh, particularly in orthognathic surgery, because moving the craniofacial skeleton can make a very powerful change in our appearance. Yeah, and so this is what we do. You know, we can take the maxilla and we can pitch and roll and yaw, and we can move the lower jaw in any sorts of ways. And then the chin uh, via genioplasty can be manipulated in any any one of a variety of directions and vectors. And so how do we do this and how do we do it accurately and how do we do it predictably and how do we do it with the, the golden ratios in mind? Well, this is how we used to do it. And this is how uh, I did it when I was a fellow. We'd start with a lateral cephalogram and we make tracing. And then we would I would take some uh, you know, trace, tracing paper and move the, move the uh, maxilla or the mandible or both depending upon the surgery and tape those little pieces to the, to the X-ray and then measure my SNA and SNB with a protractor. I don't even think most, uh, my kids don't even know what a protractor is. They've never seen one. So, and I don't know how many of you in the audience, it seems like there's some various generations. Some of you look at this picture and say, oh, I remember that. <laughs> I remember doing that the night before surgery. And, and some of you are saying, what is that guy doing? Why is he coloring on an x-ray? Like what a dummy. Um, and then we would take those tracings. It's just like, this is exactly what I did. It's not one of my cases, but um, we, we, we plan the surgery this way. And then with the next step of, of technological advancement when, and uh, software like Dolphin, we can actually identify some of the key supplementary points and get a full analysis, many different kinds of analyses, Rickert's analysis, Steiner's analysis, and so on. And we can we could then sort of calculate the optimal movements based on a computer model or a software algorithm. Um, and then we can superimpose uh, photos of the patient and give the patient some idea of what uh, the outcome might look like. And, you know, sort of rudimentary, but much more sophisticated than tracing and drawing everything out. 
But ultimately, this is what we would do. We would go into the dental lab. We would take impressions of our patients. We would pour stone models. We would mount the models. And then this patient with a class three malocclusion, we would do the model surgery, make an acrylic splint based on this relationship. And we go to the operating room. And, you know, for, for a patient like this, who just has a simple sort of non-cleft, non-canted, straightforward uh, malocclusion, class three malocclusion of a negative overjet of a few millimeters, that's still probably, you know, I think you can probably just take some models, come up with a final occlusion, make a splint, and that's acceptable. But when we get into even uh, sort of simple case, but a more complicated than a one, one jaw, five millimeter advancement, you know, a guy with mid-face hypoplasia, dolicofacial profile, uh, mandibular prognatism with a more severe class three malocclusion, then I think this is what most of us are doing if we have access to it. And, um, you know, we, we still take our models. In fact, I work with a couple of orthodontists now who don't even take models anymore. They take uh, intraoral digital photographs and send me an STL file. And I send that FT STL file to the vendor and they digitize the occlusion. And uh, along with a comb beam CT scan or a medical grade CT scan. And we do all this modeling in our offices in a fraction of the time it took to trace the cephalogram, do the model surgery, create the splint. And before surgery, we get a FedEx box that comes in the mail. And we have everything we need for surgery. And we can measure the, uh, the cephalometric angles. We can measure the facial height for pre-op and post-op and choose in a matter of minutes. Like it takes me around for one jaw, it takes just a few minutes, really. For a two jaw case, uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes of preparation, uh, which is a huge time saver and probably uh, planning with more high fidelity. You have all the... Uh, guidance for where to make your cuts to avoid the nerves. Uh, the, the fidelity is down to the millimeter of movement. And now with CAD CAM technology, you can even, uh, again, depending upon your institution and the resources available to you, if you have it at your disposal and you're so inclined, you can order cut, custom cutting guides that will show you exactly where to make the cuts on the patient based on the surgical plan. And then custom hardware, custom plates and screws. So you don't have to bend your screws and waste time in the operating room. Oh, it's the wrong angle and I have to redo it and so on. So this is clearly, uh, I think, a benefit uh, to us. And I think, you know, I'm not telling you anything new. And you can get good sort of product, uh, predictable and stable results and so on. Um, the other place where it's very useful for me is in patient education. So compared to that you know, dolphin uh, image I showed with the uh, patient's photograph superimposed, you can show the patient who's not sure uh, what they might want to do in surgery, some of the rendered three-dimensional options and help them make their decision. So this is a patient who has lateral deviation prognatism of the, of the mandible, and she wanted, you know, the, the least surgery she can, she could get away with, you know, she didn't want to have a big operation. So so I was able to, through virtual surgical planning, I was able to show her what, you know, a rough approximation of what she would look like if we just did a BSSO to realign the mandible with the maxilla with nothing else. Uh, but that will leave her with this occlusal cant and, you know, a malposition genioplasty segment. And then what it would look like with a two jaw surgery, Lafort and BSSO without a genioplasty. And then what it would look like with an added genioplasty. And in her case, it was very informative because she went from just wanting the most minimal surgery to choosing two-jaw surgery with a genioplasty uh, based to some degree on the soft tissue profile, showing that the cant is corrected and the chin is in a more proper position. So, so that's really helpful, clearly. Um, what about the application of this sort of technology to mandibular reconstruction? Yes or no? I think, again, very similar to orthognathic surgery, yes. This is um, this is the first time I use actually this version of this technology. This is a, a young girl with mild cherubism, very mild, and you can see her left mandible, left side of her face is a little more full than the right side, and she just felt that she wanted a little bit uh, more symmetry. So before when I started my career about twenty years ago, before this technology was readily available, 
um, I would just take her to the operating room like most of us and just sort of use our artistic sensibility and just shave the mandible down. And you know, on the table, see if I get a you know the symmetric result. Um, but now to to get a you know a, a high fidelity result and 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 a case where it's not such a major thing to try and be as accurate as possible, I can do the surgical planning. And I've never used one of these before, but this is a, a custom implant that can be placed on the mandible and based on the the CT scan, <clears throat> these these uh, little burr holes allow me to drill only to a specific depth based on the heat map of the mandible. And then once I drill all those holes, I can go with a, a high-speed cutting burr, like a diamond burr or a, or a acorn burr or whatnot, and drill out those holes and get pretty good result. Uh, and obviously in mandibular reconstruction, I think Changgung is probably the leader, one of the leaders in institutions in the world who's doing this sort of, uh, you know, free fibula reconstruction of the mandible using pre-surgical modeling. And uh, this is a paper that a friend of mine at NYU, Jamie Levine, wrote called the Jaw in a Day, where you have the mandible, the resection, resection of the lesion, the free fibula reconstruction, and the dental implants placed all in one operation. And uh, this, you know, I think this would be possible, but very difficult to do without the application of this technology. So distraction, I think distraction is also another place where many of us are now accept this technology as standard. Um, so this is a patient with Pierre Robin sequence um, uh, who I did mandibular distraction on. And, you know, do we need, so, you know, do we need this technology to, um, to get this result in these patients and get good outcomes? Um, well, many of us were not using this technology. Uh, and even as it was being introduced, many of us still don't. And then Jordan, who I think may be on the call, and Joe Williams uh, taught us that if you follow these patients, there's a pretty significant incidence of dental trauma and nerve injury because of the anatomy. Everything's very compact. And you know, we're using, we're not using baby instruments. We're using the same type of instruments. It's a, we're cutting bone and we're manipulating uh, the bone tissue in the area of the the dental pulp and the inferior alveolar nerve, and so so we're we're probably doing more damage than we appreciate. And and Jordan and his team helped bring this to light. And so, what's the alternative? Well, if we apply this technology here, we can be much more accurate in the placement of our osteotomies, and importantly, we can learn with you know this sort of data exactly where the primordial teeth are located exactly where the nerve is located. We can choose our osteotomy to avoid them. We can choose specific sites, specific screw holes in our distractor devices to avoid them. And I like getting this model, even though UCLA gives me a hard time because it costs a few extra thousand dollars, but it shows me exactly where the model is. It shows me this is a cutting guide I'm going to use in the operating room. And the little a solid uh, bar between the L-shaped gaps, that's where the nerve is passing. So that's where I'm going to just uh, very carefully uh, cut instead of using the drill, I'm gonna use an osteotome there and basically green stick fracture that. And these are the, the drill holes I'm gonna choose based on the anatomy of the nerve, which I have from the model. And then you can get excellent results in these patients. Um, for me, distraction of the posterior cranial vault has been very, uh, has been facilitated by the by the adaptation of of virtual surgical planning, because and my and my neurosurgeon actually likes it too because they can sort of see where some of the critical vascular structures are, uh, in particular sagittal sinus and the torcula, and these these cutting guides help actually orient the. I'll go back one side. The cutting guides really help orient the um, the vectors of the distractors. So otherwise, before having this at my disposal, and and many of us still do and can do very well, just position the the vectors, and we sort of have to just sort of see, you know, based on our our bird's eye view that we're matching our vectors. But this sort of takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. And not only that, in terms of pre-surgical planning, you can get very detailed data on what your surgery what how what your surgery will result in in, ter in terms of volume expansion 
And that's something that, you know, it's can be very important when you determine your surgical plan. Um, distraction of the mid face. This is a um, paper I wrote with Jim Bradley um, describing uh, facial bipartition and monoblock distraction. And we did not, this was published, I think in 2003 or can't remember when, but it was before the, the era of, of widely uh, adapted virtual surgical planning. We would do these by hand. And this is a case I did with my dear friend, Cassio Raposo in Brazil. I mean, I got a pretty good result just from, you know, the, just from looking at it and, and making the plan based on CT scans only without virtual surgical planning and intra placement of these devices. Um, and then this is a patient I did at UCLA also without surgical planning. And she also turned out okay. This was a, not by, by partition, but just a monoblock distraction. You know, the result is okay, but you see from the worm's eye view, there's some asymmetry in the area of the zygoma. And, you know, could I have avoided that when, if I'd used virtual surgical planning and had perfectly symmetric uh, distraction vectors, perhaps. And so we're preparing for her. She's now 10 years older. We're going to do a Lefort 3 minus Lefort 1. And I have at my disposal these sort of uh, play, cutting guides and placement guides that will help really determine a very consistent vector and symmetric vector. Um, and then, of course, plan the orthognathic uh, portion of the procedure following the, the mid-face distraction. For me, craniosynostosis is more of a maybe. It's not necessarily a yes or no. Um, so there are lots of people who uh, who now are using, you know, virtual surgical planning and craniosynostosis surgery. You know, in my experience, this, and I can only speak to my experience, and I respect what people's experience is and how, what they publish. And this paper was actually published in one of the our nature journals and, you know, one of the top-notch journals. Um, and I was a little surprised because to me, this is a little bit of technology in search of a home. When I've tried to do this for more simple cases like frontal orbital advancement or sagittal synostosis or whatnot, um, I find that it's the opposite of what I'm looking for. First of all, it costs a lot of money. Uh, second of all, it, it takes a lot of time. The planning of it takes a lot of time compared to orthognathic surgery, which really is expedient. And then in the operating room, I find all of these uh, models and such to be very cumbersome and really added surgical time instead of decreased surgical time, which is a burden on the patient physiologically. So, um, so for me, you know, this is a, from this paper, the patient they presented and they're showing a very lovely intraoperative result or immediate postoperative result using all of this uh, navigation and uh, modeling and to help form the bone. And this is sort of an on-table result that, that I've gotten in similar type of case without using this technology. And so, uh, so for me, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's necessary. Um, similar for sagittal synostosis, you know, the, the, the cost benefit ratio cost, not only in terms of financial cost, but also in terms of the time it takes before surgery and during surgery to get the result. I think, you know, I do a reverse pyplasty type of technique that Dr. Kamoto taught me and on table, we get a good result and those table, those results are long lasting. And so this is all done pretty, you know, expediently without the use of this technology. So where I, where I would consider using, and I think is in cases like this, where there's a syndromic child with a severely misshapen skull, where there's no, there's really no framework, no frame of reference for where to move these bones. So in a case like this, where I'm doing a total cranial vault remodeling, then I think maybe it may be warranted to, to help, you know, detail or plan what the bone cuts will be, reposition the bones, et cetera. Um, but otherwise for me, I don't think it's important. And then, um, in terms of sort of composite or complex neurosurgical craniofacial skull base resections, I think this is sort of an emerging field where, you know, we used to just remove these lesions or the neurosurgeons would and send us these patients with these defects. And so I'm sure many of you are, as we are doing at UCLA, as we're trying to tackle these in one stage um, with virtual surgical planning. So this was, a, and I do these plans with the neurosurgeons. I'm, I'm very big on collaboration. I think that you know, disciplines working separate from each other results in a, in a suboptimal patient outcome. If I'm working with a neurosurgeon um, uh, for skull reconstruction, we're doing this plan together. If I'm planning an orthomathic surgery, 
I'm planning it with the orthodontist. And so this is a lytic uh, tumor of the frontal process and the zygoma and the orbit. And, you know, we can tell the, the technicians, um, you know, hey, here's where, here's the margin of resection we want. And they can design the implant uh, around the margin of resection. So we go to the operating room and I think there's a video here. So we, we expose the area and then using the, using the template uh, that, that the vendors provided us, we can mark out the osteotomy or the craniotomy that we want to perform. And then the neurosurgeon and I will resect that. And then we'll go ahead and put the, the reconstructive plate, the prefabricated reconstructive plate. Sorry. So similar cases, um, you can see the, on the two-dimensional views, which are a little bit more and more accurate in terms of trying to identify disease versus non-disease bone. You can identify the area of resection and the implant and make the three-dimensional surgical plan. They send you these products. I'm getting a little redundant, I think. I don't want to put anyone to sleep. This is that patient's tumor when we lift up the scalp flaps. And um, this is the resection of the tumor. This is using the guide to show uh, the margin of bone that we want to take. Uh, around the area of bone erosion. And then finally, this is fitting the implant. Oh my God, it's a mess. It's a video mess here. Three videos, ridiculous. And, uh, and then we get closure. And then for, for, you know, periorbital tumors, skull-based tumors like this, same idea. Uh, instead of treating this as two separate problems, an oncologic resection and a craniofacial plastic surgery reconstruction, we do this together with the neurosurgeons. We identify uh, the, the anticipated defect, and here's the implant here. This is the design of the implant. And you know, these patients can have good results in one stage procedures. Um, and that's what the implant looks like in situ. Um, and just part and parcel of this is intraoperative navigation. We use a system at UCLA called Brain Lab, which is a pretty well-known system globally, I think. And I think Brain Lab is also very good for, um, for intraoperative navigation. You know, do we need Brain Lab to uh, to do an orbit fracture? Mm, I don't know. I think uh, Brain Lab can be a little bit cumbersome to set up. And here's some, you know, just uh, pictures of, you know, just imaging of the orbital floor and stuff. And and I've used this in 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 a fracture setting and facial trauma setting. But what I do, where I reserve it for now, is for combined cases with neurosurgeon composite or complex tumor reconstruction. But I think navigation is, you know, one of the facts. So it's, uh, I'm going to spend just a few more minutes now on the rest because the fictional aspect and the emerging stuff is there's less known about, there's less experience. I think there's less to, to uh, expound upon. But these are things that are here already, robotic surgery, augmented reality, virtual reality. And, and I'm not saying that these are not really applicable to, to our field, but I, my, my impression now is that we're trying to figure that out. And people are, um, are trying to determine whether or not this, is, this will be beneficial to us. You know, just because there's a robot in the operating room that the cardiothoracic surgeons use, should we use it in the craniofacial room? I, I don't know. Um, and this is a, a Taiwanese native, Lisa Su, who's a CEO of uh, AMD. And uh, it's a very common sense sort of a quote with technical technological advances there's a very natural curve between cost and complexity and adoption so we have to find the sweet spot um and and in addition that's in business i guess but in in our business specifically um uh, applicability there has to be you know as we mentioned earlier a, a reason a good reason to be using it so you know i think robotic surgery has been amazing for some uh, gi surgery thoracic surgery uh, some other type of surgery. And I think it's great for education. This is the UCLA Kazit Center. We have a full um, lab where we teach the residents uh, to use robotic maneuvers and robotic instrumentation 
but this is primarily the realm of general surgeons. In fact, I've I've sat down with the director of this lab and I said, hey, can we come up with some you know plastic surgery uh, applications to sort of teach our residents you know robotic technique? And and we sat down over a cup of coffee and we really couldn't come up with a lot, um, at least in my opinion, where the robot would be useful. But now we're starting to see some publications like this come out in the literature over the past couple of years. Um, and and when I, it, it a little bit makes me scratch my head uh, because having been in the operating room where the general surgeons or the thoracic surgeons have used the robot and uh, see it, it's really an extra burden of time and effort and it's not very easy to use. It's 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 the, the, there's a, a very steep, well, maybe not a steep learning curve, a sort of shallow learning curve. It takes some time to become facile with this instrumentation. And, um, and in the end, does it meet those criteria of, of, uh, of being useful, being uh, making a positive impact on patient outcome and so on. And even the authors um, here in this experimental study using the robot for essentially mandibular osteotomy said the problem of narrow space for conducting the procedure and changeable target for calculating the trajectory still remained. And this problem needs further study and clinical trials. So there are, I think, issues even amongst the people who are studying this, identifying um, uh, potential issues with wide application of robotic surgery. So yes or no. In my practice, it's a no. I don't, I don't see any application for this currently in my practice, but I'm certainly looking at all this literature um, with great interest. Now, AR and VR is very sexy, you know, um, people love putting these uh, devices on and um, people are starting to uh, experiment or explore how these can be used in plastic surgery. I think there are fields where there is, um, there is a good um, potential for application, particularly in neurosurgery, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and just for definition, for those of you who are not looking at this material, VR uh, completely re replaces the environment and AR sort of takes data or imaging or other sort of uh, computer generated content and projects it onto the physical landscape. And um, so for example, here's a, a study that was published some five years ago. I'm, I'm, I was surprised when I started looking into this to see that, you know, I thought this these papers would just be a couple of years old, but some of these papers go back five, six years. And uh, they all involve some sort of digital registering system. Um, and then some sort of uh, overlay of a virtual surgical plan, such as we discussed earlier, through a headset onto the, the patient. And so these are some um, images of what the surgeon may see. So they have the virtual surgical plan and they're wearing the headset and they can then use their, whether they're saws or instruments to make high fidelity cuts based on that plan. Um, I don't know. I don't know if uh, it, it's tricky enough getting deep in the recesses of the buccal corridors to make these cuts in the mandible. I'm not sure that this um, this to me seems a little cumbersome and distracting. I've never used it, so I can't say from experience. Um, but even the authors uh, say that, um, uh, even the authors of this particular study, which I thought was a pretty good study, say that the, the correlating the displayed image with the surgical field is difficult. Um, and uh, due to the complex 3D geometry and the need for precise facial asymmetry, an appropriate image guide system is required. So in other words, it's very technically challenging. It's not easy um, to do. And this has been described, that was in uh, orthognathic surgery. This has been described for more complex craniofacial surgery like box osteotomy. And again, similar type of, of uh, overlay onto the, onto the, the patient through the headset to, in theory, allow the surgeon to make more accurate cuts. Um, or, you know, yes or no for me, I think uh, it's a work in progress, but I think with good virtual surgical planning and good uh, cutting guides and uh, so on, that I think augmented reality doesn't hold up to just virtual surgical plan with the appropriate uh, custom-made 3D printed hardware. Um, in, in terms of virtual reality, you know, this is my idea of what virtual reality is. Like these are, you know, this is like, 
<laughs> and maybe some of you have these headsets you for your kids and stuff. see the red line but, um and and I, I like the idea of applying this sort of technology to the operating room but um i'm just not sure that uh that that it that there's a home here for this technology i think it's great for education and this is something that joe mccarthy and court cutting uh, published years ago. I think this was, uh, I don't have the date here. I think this was back in 2006 or 2010 or something. So I think for, for to put on a headset and to be able to fly through the craniofacial skeleton and appreciate the anatomy, I think that's very informative for our, our surgeries. Um, but, you know, the, the neurosurgeons have something called uh, um, surgical theater, which is a, a virtual reality uh platform that allows them to image anything they want in the brain, but specifically vascularity to help them navigate the, the vasculature during tumor resection. And Isaac Yang, a very dear friend of mine, who's one of our top neurosurgeons, I asked him what he thinks about virtual reality in his, in his work. And he said, it really helps me identify the margins of the tumor and the vessels and get a clean resection. So great. He thinks it's of great use. Dr. Everson, his colleague, another dear friend of mine said, surgical theater, I thought we got rid of that POS a long time ago. And as you all know, POS means piece of shit. So I don't know how you say that in Taiwanese, but he, he thinks that this is garbage basically because it's cumbersome. It's, you know, the surgeon needs to have their eyes and their hands on the patient, not on a, on a, on a digital device. And actually most of the publications to date looking at VR um, are really emphasize its strength in teaching and uh, anatomy and so on, but not yet uh, um, in terms of practical application in the operating room, a lot of simulation and so modeling and simulation. So yes or no, I think getting there, but we have to really find the right surgery and the right application. Um, I've gone over way over half hour. So I'll just uh, uh, say one thing about AI. Um, Jensen Huang, another uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, software is eating the world, but AI is going to eat software. There's a lot of attention being given to AI in plastic surgery uh, and its potential role specifically in craniofacial surgery. And this is, um, uh, you know, I need someone like Jordan Steinberg to read these articles and, and tell me what they mean, because this is beyond me. And you know, you have to learn about neural networks and uh, you really have to have an engineering mind for this. But basically this is, you know, AI to me is the accumulation of data and having, uh, you know, having a machine as opposed to a human or our machine up here, um, process that data and generate output. So there, you you know, it, it comes down to algorithms and um what algorithms you can apply to a certain clinical scenario and so on. And so um, um, this is a quote from that article I just showed, craniofacial surgeons do not need to understand and know every detail of AI technology, uh, but it's important for them to understand its core characteristics and technical architecture. And then there was this formula in the paper as one of the ex examples of the uh, core characteristics and technical architecture. So I'm just a dumb craniofacial surgeon and I don't understand that. So anyone who does, please call me after this meeting and explain to me what that formula is. But I think it's, it's certainly valid to pursue the idea of mass learning uh, or mass data processing to expedite and make more efficient our, our decision-making process, at least pre-surgically perhaps. And certainly I think it's a great tool for research. Um, I'm not going to talk about biomodeling, but because it's similar to virtual surgical planning and same uh, gene therapy, stem cell therapy. These are all things that, uh, you know, is it all technology in search of a home? Maybe, but that doesn't mean we can't find the right home for it in our field and be able to apply, you know, work with our engineering colleagues and our biotechnology colleagues and really offer the, the best, most advanced, most sophisticated uh, level of care to our patients and really drive this field forward together. Um, I really like this quote, quote from the Spanish artist Gaudi, tomorrow we will do beautiful things because it really speaks to the 
future facing perspective that all of us, I think, have, because we all want to do better tomorrow than we did yesterday. And so um, with that, I want to say thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'm sorry I ran late. And uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, uh, I'm not sure, Dr. Tu, how you want to manage that. And also, if you have any questions about the combined symposium uh, that uh, Dr. Choi was discussing, uh, yeah, please reach out to us uh, after the the conference here or at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Girari, for your um presentation. I think your presentation was amazing and it was nothing like you said, not it might be boring or whatever. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I had a blast listening to it. So um, um next our on our agenda um is the panelist discussion so first i'd like to invite professor lin of chungin memorial hospital for some comments professor lin hi professor jarahi and uh thank you very much for your inspiring lecture and especially the later part about the uh the augmented uh reality the uh the a robotic surgery part. And uh, to, to me, I have some questions about the, uh, the balance between the cost and the technology because many of our patients, uh, especially the craniofacial patients, they, they uh, sometimes have some uh, financial issues, especially when we provide some advanced technology and trying to to do the uh to do, do the better option for them, uh sometimes in our country we have uh, even we have uh national insurance but that part of advanced tech technology was not uh was not uh, sponsored by the uh, national insurance payment. So uh in your opinion, what's What's the possible solutions and what's the uh, possible uh, evolutions to these issues? Uh, thank you, um, Professor Lin. I, it's a it's a very difficult subject, and it really, you know, it bothers me to be honest with you because um, you know I do a lot of global health work, and I really do believe that healthcare is a right um, and and not a privilege. It's a human right. And we definitely in the United States, even though we also have a government and state funded health care, um, we really have a two tier system where uh, people who are able to afford very expensive private insurance or just pay out of pocket uh, for their health care have access to certain things that others do not. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, I have a very dear friend, uh, Dana Johns, who will actually be in Seoul, Korea with us. And we both do some facial feminization surgery, as I'm sure many of us on the call do as craniofacial surgeons, depending upon you know where you live and where you work. And so at UCLA, which is a very high resourced institution, I'm able to do uh, virtual surgical planning for my facial feminization surgery. And I, it, it really helps. I feel I get a more predictable result. I feel the accuracy of my bone movements is to the millimeter. And um, I really enjoy incorporating it into my practice. UCL, the, the, my patient has no, it has no impact on them because UCLA, when they sort of absorb that cost and they know that, you know, sometimes I have to fight them for I have to fight the financial approval committee to allow a certain you know, planning or a certain uh, custom implant to be made and so on. My friend, uh, Dr. Johns at University of Utah, which is also an academic medical center, well-funded, she does not use uh, virtual surgical planning in her cases because the university does not pay for it. And she would have to pass that cost on to her patients. And, and the vendors, they do not give discount. I mean, sure, but this is thousands and thousands of dollars. This is an expensive process. And so I don't know the solution. Um, uh, I just know that, um, that right now, the current application of this technology is, is, it's not defined by equity. I'll put it to you that way. And, 
And for example, I go down to Brazil every year or two to operate with my friends down there. They don't have access to any of this. So then it begs the question, do you need it? Because I've gotten the most beautiful results working with my friends in, in Campinas in Brazil um, who don't use a and technology compared to what we have. So, so it, it's, it, it's a it's a difficult situation. And then I'm sure there are people on here who are working in the developing world where this is just sort of a, a dream because, you know, even to get, you know, uh, well, I have friends who have to make their own distractor devices because they cannot afford to buy the ones that are on the market from the, the major vendors. So it's a good question. There's not a good answer. And I'm hoping that you know, as we evolve, we we all globally take responsibility to make healthcare truly equitable for all for everyone. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lind. And next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Hemi Lack from UT Southwestern. Hello, Professor Halak, can you hear us? Hey, yes. Um, well, uh, Dr. Jarahi, thank you for your presentation, especially giving us the opportunity to delve into this fantastic topic. Uh, I guess from what you showed in your slides, uh, it seems like the technology has been a big help for plastic surgeons when it comes to planning and improving the surgical outcomes. But now, since we have like AI technology and um, that can make decisions, how do you think this will change the, the way we do surgeries, especially that these technologies are increasingly being put in the hands of surgeons, I mean, patients? Yeah, um, it's, I'm, I'm smiling because as soon as you said that, it made me think of, you know, every day in the, in the surgery lounge, um, I see my residents and the general surgery residents and the vascular surgery residents are getting ready for their case. And how are they getting ready for a surgery? They're looking at YouTube videos, right? And uh, and I just I I think I am getting so much older, and and you know maybe I deserve that I look a hundred years old compared to JW from that those two pictures. But I, it's shocking to me, like the way I prepared for surgery for so many years was I read and I read more and I read more and I went to the anatomy lab and I did more cadaver dissections and so on. So I. Uh, so that's one way of looking at it. the other way is just virtual surgical planning and orthognathic surgery. I think we run the risk of well, I, let's. I, I'm a firm believer in, in the application of these technologies, and AI is the is probably the most exciting, um, latest iteration of technology that's going to come to us. In you know, I mean, it's hard to get a show of hands because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, people's video is off, but. I've never come close to using AI in any type of surgery that I've done. Uh, Jordan, do you use it? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, you know, I found it helpful in some complex tumor cases, for example, just to review ahead of time before going to the operating room, just as you said. Right. So in terms of surgical preparation, yes. And so um, one, so I think that I have a lot of thoughts on this. If I, you know, I remember talking to uh, Tony Wolf, who I'm sure many of you know or who have read his work, and um, you know, Tessier's most uh, prolific student. And uh, Tony published with Kalmoto, who was his classmate as fellows with Tessier, a few articles uh, a few years ago about basic craniofacial techniques like cranial bone grafting that people just don't practice anymore because they're not being taught that fundamental skill, why aren't they being taught it and why aren't they practicing it in their residency and fellowship? Because you can click a button and get a, a peak implant or a custom titanium you know, framework. And so I think there's we run the risk of losing some of the artistry of our field. And orthognathic surgery is a great example. My fellows now they, if I show them a cephalometric tracing, I mean, they sort of have seen it before, but they don't know how to measure out the angles. They don't know how to, you know, they don't even, un unless they go to the ASMS basic course, they don't know how to take impressions and do model surgery. And I think the basis of all this technology, 
lies in really fundamental principles and fundamental techniques or basic techniques like we call at the SMS. And so I think we have to be wary of just sort of, oh, someone showed up in my office with lunch and, they're, and they want to show me their product, their technology product. Uh, lunch was pretty good. I'm going to try this product. Oh, it makes things easier. And without having an appreciation of the science behind it or the physiology behind it or even the anatomy behind it, I think we have to be careful moving forward. I think we have to use these. These will these techniques and these processes will will revolutionize our our work. But I think we we can't forget, you know, the fact that Paul Tessier spent every night taking a train between Nantes and Paris doing cadaver studies and taking the craniofacial skeleton apart and putting it back together because that's that's the work that all of our work currently is founded upon and the future work to come. So as long as we don't lose track of that and appreciate that we have to continue to do the work to learn and teach the fundamentals, then I'm all for all this technology. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Halak. And, um, oh, whoops, my bad. Um, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Steinberg for some comments. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, wonderful lecture, Reza, thanks. Um, I hope it's not still snowing there in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what today brings, it's crazy. Um, quick question uh, before my main question, which is um, for the April symposium, um, because I don't think we've received too much information through the ASMS yet, but is there a virtual uh, option? J-Dub? Yeah. So actually, uh, so please understand that actually <laughs> we didn't have enough time for the promotion because we only have a uh, six months preparation period so far. So actually, um, uh, but actually we prepared whole three days the uh, the programs, including the virtual and some augmentation. Actually, especially one room, we'll discuss all the first industrial revolution technology with the. Uh, industries and actually engineering the professors. So it will be very interesting. But actually, I actually, uh, I'd like to invite many of them in this room, but including the uh, Dr. Lonjo Lo and many uh, faculties from Changgung, but uh, because of the budget and the limited time, please understand that. And so hope uh, I will be able to meet you in the um, November. And then actually some of you, hope you, hopefully, it will come to this joint symposium in April. And Jordan, we just sort of finalized the, the slides that uh, JW was showing, the, the announcement slides and program slides. So I'm going to start pushing that out through the ASMS um, pretty soon. And what I forgot to say, or a slide I wanted to put in, I just remembered I forgot, is you know the International Society for Craniofacial Surgery is the, the meeting. Richard Hopper is the president uh, this year, and the meeting is going to be September, God, I want to say 4th through 8th in Seattle. And the pre-conference symposium, and I've spoken to him about this, is actually based, is focused on AI, AR, VR, and all the things that I just very briefly spoke about. So if those for those of you who are interested in learning about this more, and it's really going to be from what he described to me, more um, tech oriented, not necessarily surgery uh, oriented. Um, so with a lot of the vendors and creators of this uh, of this this hardware and software are going to be there showing their work and presenting and with a lot of hands-on uh, uh, interaction with their devices. So um, so I'm, I'll put in a plug in for Dr. Hopper. And invite you all to to come to the International Society and and Seattle in September. My son goes to college in Seattle now. It is beautiful. And then just one more uh, quick point. So, and I was wondering if you could comment on the soft tissue aspects because you know I think this comes up in any um, lecture about the uh, technology and particularly the the planning, the virtual planning. Because if you take the example that you showed, let's say of the uh, infant with the mandibular distraction, uh, or a complex cranial vault remodeling case, 
Um, one of the things that that I think that um, many of us have learned a little bit the hard way, and especially for the for the newer uh, surgeons, is that you can plan a case very elegantly on the computer that's that is really focused on the bone work, but then uh, there can be issues with respect to the soft tissue accommodation of that plan. So, with the distractor example, you know you can drill the holes in that precise location, put the device, but then find, let's say, that the shaft or the turning arm doesn't come out exactly where you would like it. And so the finesse of negotiating all of those things in the operating room is lost because it's telling you to put it in one exact way uh, location. Or with the cranial vault, for example, you you know, you know have a, a nice volume expansion or, or a adjustment of the of the shape, but yet the soft tissue closure is a problem. So I think um, whether it's the AR, VR, or the VSP, um, one of the things is this this inability to um, to sort of bring in that whole other dimension. Yeah, this you know when they say you know in any endeavor the devil's in the details. The soft tissue is the devil in what we do. You know we're primarily, at least I feel I'm a carpenter and, uh, you know, I like the bone and I like the instruments I use on the bone and I want to cut bone and move bone and fix bone and soft tissue is often the enemy of that, certainly in the secondary setting. Right. And that's what we all learn from, uh, Joe Gruss, God rest his soul. Um, I, it's funny, I just wrote this uh, chapter for Peter Taub's upcoming book on craniosynostosis, and he asked me to write about fixation. I wrote about how important fixation is in craniosynostosis surgery for just that reason. You can get a beautiful expansion, whether it's posterior, anterior, mid-vault, and then you pull this scalp over it, and it starts from the, from the second you're done with surgery, it starts fighting against your result. But I think you, the term you used is, is the exact one, uh, and it's something that we all do and need to do and maybe impress our trainees with is finesse you know so you have uh, a surgical plan and you go to the surgical plan and it's very easy when you're doing this you know video uh, session uh, surgical planning session with a computer nerd sitting somewhere in an office and and you go to the operating room it's like oh wait a minute it's not quite you know and this is what i was talking to rami about earlier that's that's when we fall back on our our skill set. That's why we can't just be dependent on on clicking something and doing a session and getting something in the mail. Oh, this is going to fit perfectly. No, we're surgeons and we have to use our surgical training to finesse those challenges that we have, even with the expectation of a sort of a perfectly fitting, uh, seamless integration from plan to execution so it's a challenge and and i think the soft tissue component is the bigger challenge because you know the 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 when i showed some cases where we're doing these primary composite resections and reconstructions and i'm sure you all are doing that um but when the the risk you run is that the neurosurgeon may say oh i need to take more bone I'm going to take less bone. You know, the tumor looked different on CT scan than it does here in the operating room. And then your implant doesn't fit. And if it's the calvarium, that's not such a big deal. But if it's in the skull base, it's it's a little bit more difficult to, to, to whittle away your implant or bring in more bone because there's a larger gap and put a bone graft. So I think that... Um, well, I think that we, those are the times when we finesse, that we have, then we fall back on our principles and, and it shows that um, that surgical planning isn't the end all be all. And one for, for those of us who do rhinoplasty, you know, even that patient that I uh, showed you who had the multiple different options of her jaw surgery, one jaw, two jaws, two jaws with genio, those soft tissue overlays, as we all know, from you know maybe cosmetic oriented patients people tend to see those as a contract you know you show them that plan like oh i'm going to look like this and i don't use that when i do rhinoplasty i don't do that modeling software and people ask me for it and i don't i don't give it to them because no matter how much you tell them look this is just an approximation this is computer pixels your your skin and 
muscles aren't necessarily going to move in this direction exactly like this, um, I find that they don't believe it. And so we have to, you know, really focus on counseling in order to, to manage their expectations. But, but I think you're right, Jordan. It's a, it's a challenge for all of us, particularly in, you know, tumor resection recurrent in a radiated field when the soft tissue is just not your friend, then it's even more difficult. Thank you, Professor Steinberg. And last but not least, I'd like to invite um, Professor Lowe. Professor Lowe. Uh, hi, Dr. Uh, Jarahi. It's uh, very nice to hear, uh, listen to your talk. Uh, very, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, things uh, from the past, current, and also uh, to, to the future application. I I do agree with your um most of your idea that uh, you know especially for robotic AI uh, AI VR uh, I think that will be maybe will be our future application but right now it's still not yet uh, fully mature uh, to be you know to be used uh, in the uh, in this in the current situation I do have a, a question that I need your answer that you mentioned that you when you do a uh, virtual surgery planning for also Nazi surgery and you do pre-surgical consultation you show the bone change and you also show the soft tissue change uh, however what do you think about the accuracy of the soft tissue change following the bone change yeah, as you know, Professor Lowe, thank you. It's it's a great question, and it's something that uh, I struggle with, and maybe some of you struggle with, and how to counsel patients because these are primarily I'm doing my orthognathic surgery in teenagers. They are very concerned about their physical appearance, and I want to you know address their anxiety by trying to describe what I think is gonna be the result. And I wanna be accurate. I don't like to make promises I can't keep, but I also, you know, based on my experience, I like to give them some encouragement that things are going to work, uh, work out well for them. Um, and as I was just mentioning to Dr. Steinberg, I think that is a challenge because, you know, I've seen, and, and perhaps you have as well, when they make the bone movements, the, you can see the soft tissue overlay uh, just make like a one-to-one -one ratio adjustment. And there's there's literature, there's plenty of literature that describes soft tissue change, for example, of the nose and the lip relative to millimeters of maxillary advancement. Um, I, I, I don't put a lot of faith in that literature other than in general principles. I know if we advance the maxilla, then the lip is going to raise. And so we have to take that into account in our surgical planning. But, you know, a cleft patient with scarred lip, are they going to move the same as a non-cleft patient with no scars in the lip and so on? So I use the, uh, well, for example, in that case I showed, one, one thing that this young lady had was uh, she had an occlusal cant. And so she originally just wanted to just have her uh, lower jaw corrected, uh, have the mandible indexed to the maxilla, and that's it. And just because on physical exam and in person, when she smiles, you know, she she was just so used to her appearance, she was not able to see the cant of her of her of her teeth nor of her lips. Um, and as we all know, basic fundamental principles, uh, and this is what Henry Kamoto taught me for many years, that the soft tissue follows the bone. So if you correct the bone and the bone is tilted, the soft tissue is still going to be tilted. Um, everyone knows that. So when I showed her that soft tissue profile of the BSSO alone versus the bimaxillary surgery, and she saw that oh, her, the corners of her mouth were now straighter. Well, then that's she signed on immediately, just like that. So I think, but again, when I show those pictures and say, this is, not, this is not how your soft tissue moves in the operating room. This is some guy or some gal in a room going click, 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 
and then the pixels move. That is not how our bodies work. And some of them understand that very well, and some people not so much, because if you're showing them a picture they like, they're like, oh, they get married to that image. So I think you have to be very clear in your communication. I try to be. Um, but there there can be some value in, in educating the patient and giving them some idea of what we can expect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lowe. And last on our agenda is the group photo. But before we head over to the group photo, I'd like to remind everyone that the ASMS and KCPCA Joint Symposium is from April 21st to April 23rd. And you can register at, online at www.cmfskorea.com. And also, um, if you have any questions, you're free to ask Professor Sharari or Professor Choi. Uh, Professor Choi, is there any other information that you want to relay to the audience about the conference? You know, actually, <laughs> Everything was done. So thank you so much for allowing me to make a brief the promotion. So I hope the, uh, we will be able to meet the many times in Seoul, in Seattle, and Taiwan. So, so I hope that. <laughs> yeah, we're all hoping to see you in Korea too. Yeah. Okay. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite everyone to show their faces and we'll take a group photo. Uh, together with Professor Jahari and Professor Choi. In 10 years, I will look like I've aged 50 years. <laughs> JW will look like he's gone in the opposite direction. It's not fair, really. No, no. Okay, so on three, I'll take a photo. One, two, three. Okay, and for our second page, uh, on three, one, two, three. Okay. Thank you, everyone, once again for joining us today. And it's good having you here. And thank you, Professor Jarari and Professor Choi, to come to talk to us. And we hope to see you next time. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, That's everyone. Really, thank you so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.